But I thought that was funny when reminding us that, hey, invite someone to church. Uh, in, in John 1, verse 45, it says, Philip went to look for Nathanael and told him, We have found the very person Moses and the prophets wrote about. His name is Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nazareth, exclaimed Nathanael. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Come and see for yourself, Philip replied. I think that's a great reminder for us. You know, we're going to be talking about discipleship today. But to do some discipleship, we got to invite some people to join us. Maybe we invite them to a small group. Maybe we invite them to a, a breakfast. Maybe we invite them to the worship service. But go invite them, all right? Good morning, and I'm glad to see that you're here. We got something exciting this morning. I'm going to invite Matt and Holly West to join me up in the front. Yeah, you can clap for them. You can clap for them. We're glad they're here. We are receiving Matt and Holly West. I'm going to go ahead and give you guys these. Into membership here with us via transfer. Matt is an ordained elder in the Church of the Nazarene. And they are now, Matt and Holly are both now working at the camp. And they have come to join us in membership. And they've got another one joining to be named later. <laughs> All right. Another one uh, joining their family soon. And we are just very excited to have them as a part of our, not only our camp, but our local body of believers. Would you give them a hand and welcome them? Thank you, guys. Hey, and as you see them around, get to know them a little bit. Ask them about where they're from, what they're doing. They'll give you lots more information. Speaking of information, let me give you some information, some announcements that we have. Now, you can find these in the bulletin, and you can look for more details there. But the first one I want to bring your attention to next Sunday after our worship service. Sunday, April the 21st. That's our annual meeting. We're going to be doing some voting. Also, you're going to get an opportunity to hear about some of the ministries that we have going on in the church. Maybe something you don't even know about that you can get involved in. So make sure you're here next Sunday. Sunday for our annual meeting. April 25th through the 27th, that's man camp at Bonita Park. All right, I'm planning on going. I would love to see some of you men join me in participating in man camp at Bonita Park, so make sure to check that out. And then the last thing I want to mention, May 7th, starting very early in the morning, is our Lincoln County Prayer Breakfast. There's information in here. If you'd like more information, talk with me, talk with Pastor Jan, and we'll talk to you some more about that. All right. Oh, one other thing that I need to let you know about. I talked last week when we, were, when we had our sermon on, on corporate worship that we were going to be changing how we do tithes and offerings and how we worship in that way. And you probably noticed there's, there's no plates up here. Well, that's because we're going to be passing the plate. Okay, We're going to worship in music for a while and then we're going to have the ushers come forward and have you sit. And then we're going to pass the plate as we continue to worship in music and then we'll just join right back in. Okay, And when we join back in, that'll also be the time that our kids sneak away to children's church, okay? But I'm excited that you're here today. I'm excited to get to worship with you. And now I'm going to turn it over to Brother Phil. Thank you, Jeremy. I appreciate that. Um, anybody here like exotic meats to eat? Well, we were going to have uh, alligator the other day, but we remembered only, we only had a crock pot. <laughs> Would y'all please stand with us? One through five, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Amen. Everybody say amen to that. Amen, you like the organ? That's pretty cool, isn't it? Here we go. 
Are you past the point of weary? Is your burden weighing heavy? And is it all too much to carry? Well, let me tell you about my Jesus. And do you feel that empty feeling? Cause shame's done all its stealing. And you're desperate for some healing. Let me tell you about my Jesus. Yeah, here's what he does, right? Cause he makes a way where there ain't no way Rises up from an empty grave Ain't no sinner that he can't save Let me tell you about my Jesus His love is strong and his grace is free And the good news is I know that he Can do for you what he's done price for all my guilty who would care that much about me let me tell you about my Jesus oh he makes a way where there ain't no way rises up from an empty grave ain't no sinner that he can't save let me tell you about my Jesus
free at last he has ransomed me his grace runs deep while i was a slave to sin jesus died father's house say amen amen thank you you may be seated at this time we're going to have our ushers come forward as we prepare to continue worshiping yes we're going to continue to worship in music but now is the time that we've set aside to worship in tithes and offerings so let's have our ushers come all the way to the forward all the way to the front please and then we'll ask a blessing on the offering and then we'll continue Father, we thank you for another opportunity to be in your house and to offer our worship to you. Father, may our worship bless you. May our worship be a fragrant aroma that rises up to you. As we continue to sing, may it bless your heart. And God, as we worship in tithes, Father, we just pray that you will take a portion of what you've given us. We give it back to you showing that we trust you to not only take care of us, but to use this money to grow your kingdom. God, we want to worship you today and give back to your plan. Use this for your glory, for your, glory, for your honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Holiness, holiness is what I long for. What I need Holiness, holiness Is what you want from me Faithfulness Now faithfulness, faithfulness Is what I long for Faithfulness is what I Faithfulness, faithfulness is what you want. 
righteousness. No righteousness. Righteousness is what I long for. Righteousness is what I need. And righteousness, righteousness is what you want from me. Sing out to him again. Take my heart. Take my this morning with our hearts wide open heavenly father with our voices lifted high knowing that sometimes things aren't perfect heavenly father sometimes we have a lot of reasons to praise you heavenly father and we always have a reason to praise you heavenly father but you always bless us heavenly father lord as disciples heavenly father what we what we want what we cry out this morning is that we want we want to conform to you we want to be we want to be fitted heavenly father lord with with what it is god that makes you so attractive and so heavenly father this morning we pray change us mold us make us heavenly father because that's something we've tried to do on our own and we've failed miserably but heavenly father when it comes to you you never fail you always prevail we love you, Heavenly Father. And this morning we hear your voice call out to us, God, as you beckon us to you, to that relationship, Heavenly Father. And if we have a relationship and we've fallen back, Heavenly Father, you're calling us back to you, Heavenly Father. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. And see on the portals, he's waiting and watching watching for you and for me come home come home ye who are weary come home and earnestly Tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, oh sinner, come home. Why should we tarry? Why should we tarry when Jesus is pleading, pleading for you and for me? Should we linger and heed not his mercies, mercies for you and for me? Come home. Please. 
tenderly Jesus is calling calling oh sinner come home as they were going along the road someone said to him I will follow you wherever you go and Jesus said to him foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head to another he said follow me but he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. <clears throat> and Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, no one puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Luke 9, 57 through 62. Please stand with us. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. The world behind me. The cross behind me. Just our voices, ready? And I have decided to follow Jesus. And I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. As we continue to worship, as we worship in prayer this morning, if you feel led, you can worship there as you stand, or you can, you can come and pray here at these altars, know that they are open. Let's, let's connect our hearts to God by communicating directly to Him. Father God, we are glad that we can proclaim we have decided to follow Jesus. We know that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the way to you. He is the way to forgiveness from sins. He is the way to abundant life free from sin. And God, we are excited that we get to say we follow Jesus. Now, Father, as we follow, we ask you to guide us and to direct us how you would have us as a church to go. Father, we pray that you would make our paths straight and make our paths clear so we can know what it is that you want for us to do to grow your kingdom, to be a part of your plan to redeem your creation. Father, speak to us 
in our hearts. Speak to us through your word. Give us great discernment on how we can better love this community in which you have placed us. And Father, we also have requests on our mind. We have those who are part of our family who are dealing with, with sickness. Father, we praise you that David Morris has been doing so much better. God, you, have, you, are, you are continually healing him and helping him to recover. And he, we just praise you that he is doing so much better. We ask that you can continue to, to help him. Father, we lift up Pastor Sherry as she's dealt with issues with her ankle recently and issues in her hands. Father, we just pray that you would put your hand upon her and give her healing. Guide her steps so that you can lead her to doctors that know exactly what's going on and you will guide them as well. Father, we, we ask for healing. Father, we want to lift up the nation of Israel to you today. Father, we thank you for protecting them last night as they were attacked. And Father, we know that over the next few days and over the next few weeks, there are decisions that, that are going to be made. Father, we pray that you guide those decision makers. God, we know that there is no authority that is put into place without your permission. So God, we, we, pray, for, we pray for their government leaders. Father, we pray for our government leaders. And as decisions are being made on how to move forward, God, please guide them. Please guide them. And God, I ask that for those who don't know you that are in leadership positions, place Christ followers in their path. Yes. Place people in their path that know you and who will offer godly counsel. God, as we, as we open up your word today, as we learn about being better disciples, God, I just pray that you would open our ears and open our minds and most importantly, open our hearts to receive from you, to be changed, challenged, and inspired to do life the way you have designed us to, to follow you with all we have. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, I wanted to let you know that I have a good report to start out with. You know, last week I shared with you some of the, some of the struggles that I had, but today I did not spill my coffee in Sunday school class. <laughs> So we are already on the path to improvement, okay? So things are looking up. <laughs> you know, I, uh, I sold my boat last week. Uh, that was part of our plan for when we, uh, we decided to answer the call here and we were moving here. And, and in, in selling my boat, it made me think back to when I first bought it. I had a friend who was a boat owner, and he told me when I bought my boat, he said, Jeremy, as long as you've got a boat, you've got something to do. But he didn't necessarily mean that in a good way. <laughs> yes, there would be times that I got to enjoy my boat on the water, but I, I think there was a lot more time that I was spent working on things and maintaining things and keeping up with things just so that I could continue to use my boat. And in thinking about discipleship this week, it made me think about, well, that sounds a little bit like discipleship. You know, I, I spoke last week, I think some people, they, they get saved and they think, all right, I'm good to go. Like, you get a new boat and you just think it's going to last forever and you're never going to have to work on it. You're never going to have to maintain it. But we know that discipleship means I don't just say a prayer and I'm good to go the rest of my life. No, I've got to maintain. I've got to grow. I've got to learn. I've got to connect. I've got work to do if I'm going to be a Christ-like disciple. You see, being a disciple is much different than being a student. I read this week, it's been said, a student learns what a teacher knows, but a disciple becomes what their master is. One great writer on discipleship put it this way, discipleship is the process of becoming who Jesus would be if he were you. So today, as we continue to see what we do as Angus Church... We're going to be talking about 
being and doing what it takes to be Christ-like disciples, to do Christ-like discipleship. Our, our series text is found in Acts 2. We're going to be reading this every week. So if, if you want to turn in your Bible or if you use an electronic device or if you simply want to follow along on the screen, we'll be in Acts 2 starting at verse 42. And there we read, All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. And to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all. And the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshipped together at the temple each day. Met in homes for the Lord's Supper and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. All the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. We see in this passage Christ-like discipleship there in the very first verse. They, the, the believers, they were, it says they were devoting themselves to the apostles' teachings. Not just sitting, not just listening, not just asking questions and having group discussions. The text says devoted. And devotion carries with it a much more intense meaning than just listening or just asking or just being part of a conversation. Devotion carries the idea of commitment and enthusiasm. Devotion carries commitment and enthusiasm as does Discipleship. Discipleship requires commitment to learn and to grow and to continue the process of doing so. It also requires enthusiasm to not just grow yourself, but find ways in assisting others in their growth. In Matthew 16, 24 and 25, we read, then Jesus said to his disciples, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. He was telling his disciples there and he's telling his disciples here, this discipled life requires commitment and enthusiasm because you don't take up your cross unless you're committed and you don't give up your own way unless you're excited about a new and better way and these are the things that are required in order to follow him in order to be his disciple but as he says in verse 25 what discipleship requires is absolutely worth it because giving up your life for His sake will actually save your life. So let's spend the next few moments looking at how we, Angus Church of the Nazarene, can be committed to and enthusiastic about doing Christ-like discipleship. But first, in, in order to do this whole Christ-like discipleship thing, to do it right, we need to answer a couple of questions, okay? And the first question that I think we need to look at is, how can I be like Christ? How can I be like Christ? Paul tells the church at Corinth, and in turn, all Christ's followers, he tells them in 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Being like Christ is something we're instructed to do, so we better take seriously what being like Christ looks like. The first way that we can be like Christ is to live prayerfully. Live prayerfully. And, and some of you may have noticed there's, there's some underlined words. And if you looked in your bulletin, there was a handout today. If you want to keep that handout and fill it out as we go along, it may help you uh, to, to stay uh, focused on what we're talking about today. So if you've got your bulletin there and you've got your handout, make sure you take it out. That blank right there is live prayerfully. Prayerfully. In Luke 5.16 we read, Jesus often withdrew to the wilderness for prayer. Now, we talked last week how prayer is it's a way to worship because it's communication that connects our heart to God. And we know that Jesus 
and the Father are one, yet he knew the necessity of remaining connected through the, to the Father through communication. In this passage in Luke, he gives us an example of how to remain connected to the Father. He withdraws. He withdraws from those around him in order to, in order to pray. And I think that's something that can be hard for us to do, that withdrawing. You know, one of the great things about technology is we now have the ability through our technology to remain connected to the ones we love and to remain connected to the outside world. But one of the bad things about technology is that we always seem to be connected to the outside world. And, and I know that, you know... Uh, another thing I want to mention about that, uh, Kyle Eidelman, some of you may have uh, heard of him. He's a pastor, he's an author. He did a study, or I recently did a study with, uh, with some teens that, that he was leading. And he said it this way, he said, The trouble isn't that we always have access to the world through our phones, it's that the world always has access to us. You know? And, and I know Jesus didn't have a cell phone or anything like that, but... People always wanted to be around him. They always wanted to be with him. I mean, he was miraculously feeding them. He was miraculously healing them. He was raising people from the dead. He was teaching about a new way of life full of love and full of grace and forgiveness. I'm certain there were multitudes that wanted to be around him all the time. But what did he do so that he could stay connected? And so he could give us an example. He withdrew to pray. He shut out the outside world, if only for a, a short time. Not quite yet. I'm sorry. I'm going to use the word connected a few times, but I'll give you like a little. Okay, I'm sorry. Pastor Jan is going to come talk to us about something for a few minutes. And I gave her a key word. Unfortunately, I'm going to use that key word probably 15 or 20 times. That's my fault, Pastor Jan. You were paying attention, so thank you. But we want to stay connected with the Father by withdrawing and living prayerfully. Withdraw and live prayerfully. But not only did he withdraw and live prayerfully, he also labored humbly. That's our next one. Labor humbly. Though there are many passages we could read to see this example, I think one of my favorites is in John 13. You see, in John 13, John is he's describing what's going on at the Last Supper, the night that Jesus was to be betrayed. You see, Jesus knew that the cross was near but he still had some things he wanted to teach his disciples. We're going to pick things up in verse 13. This is just after he has completed the task of washing their feet. And he wanted to see if they knew why he washed their feet. Here we read, You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, because that's what I am. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. He is showing that we are to serve, that we are to work, that we are to labor humbly. If Jesus, the all-powerful creator of everything, the all-knowing King of kings and Lord of lords, if he can stoop down and wash dirty, smelly, nasty feet, then is there any possible work that could be beneath me, a sinner saved by grace. I know that there are some jobs that we do around the church and around the community that are, we'll just say they're not desirable. There are certain tasks that need to be done that they offer zero recognition or praise. But are these needs below my attention? Are they below what I can do? Are they below the labor of a disciple of Christ? Most certainly not. If my Lord and Savior, if Jesus can wash feet, then certainly I can labor humbly. But not only do we see Jesus live prayerfully and labor humbly, in John 14 we find His instructions to lead or walk 
or live obediently, lead obediently. In verse 15, he tells his disciples, if you love me, keep my commands. And again, in verses 23 and 24 of that same uh, chapter, Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My father will love them and we will come to and excuse me, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. His instructions here and His example throughout His time on earth is to lead obediently. We remember that as He was facing the cross, He prayed, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet... Not as I will, but as you will. He obediently took on flesh and was born in a a lowly stable. He obediently lived a perfect life, showing us what it means to be full of grace, full of compassion, full of patience, and so much more. He obediently went to the cross to pay the price that my sin and that your sin required. And he obediently rose from the grave, proving his power over death and sin and inviting us to the abundant, to be joint heirs with him and this abundant life that we find in him. He set the perfect example for complete obedience. And as a Christ follower, we must follow him and his life of complete obedience. To be like him, we got to live we got to move. we got to walk. We've got to lead obediently. And finally, in becoming more like Christ, we also find that we, like Christ, must love sacrificially. Love sacrificially. In Ephesians 5, 1 and 2, Paul writes, Therefore be imitators of God and His beloved children and walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave Himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. This is the love that Jesus modeled for us, a self-giving, selfless, sacrificial love, a kind of love that looks ridiculous or reckless or even crazy to someone who doesn't know him, a kind of love that says, not my will, but yours be done, a kind of love that would drive Jesus to endure not only the agony of the cross, but the anguish and the misery of the events leading up to the cross, the beatings, the the crown of thorns, the mocking, not to mention the weight of sin for all mankind that was laid on Him as He took our place. That is the sacrificial love that is modeled for us. That's the kind of love that's required to, as we read in Matthew, give up your own way. To be like Christ, we must give up our own way. We must love sacrificially. And and listen, I've given you a few ways to be like Christ. And the truth is, we could spend months and even years diving into this deep subject of being Christ-like. However, I think this is a good way to start. Living prayerfully. Laboring humbly. Leading obediently. And loving sacrificially. That can at least give us a start down this path of becoming more like Christ. But we're talking about Christ-like discipleship. So there is more to Christ-like discipleship besides just being like Christ. Not, I, don't want, I use the word just being like Christ. I don't want you to think that I take that lightly. It's very important. But we got to also talk about this discipleship part of Christ-like discipleship. So what is discipleship? As I mentioned before, a disciple is more than a student. So let's look at a few actions that a disciple takes while participating in discipleship. First, a disciple learns. A disciple learns. In the first part of Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, we're, we're able to read, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Christ's instruction to us, his followers, his disciples, is to learn from him. We have his word to learn from. 
That's part of discipleship. We have the Holy Spirit who can speak directly to us. That's part of discipleship. We have others, other fellow followers that we can be in class with, that we can be in community with, that we can just visit with in their homes, that we can learn from. A big part of discipleship is learning. So we want to make sure that we intentionally take time to learn because a disciple learns. But if you remember, if you're just learning, you're just a student. There's more to being a disciple. Next we have a disciple models. A disciple models. Paul writes in Philippians 3.17, Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. And just as you have us as a model... Keep your eyes on those who live as we do. Paul is explaining to the Philippian church and to us that he is showing us an example of what it looks like to be a disciple. He is modeling Christ-like discipleship. And in bringing to our attention that a disciple models, he's showing us too that as disciples, we must also be models. Not only do we learn, but we live the way Christ And Paul and so many other Christ-like disciples lived. In order to be a disciple, we must be what it is to be, excuse me, we must model what it is to be a disciple because a disciple models. Yet there is still more besides just learning and modeling. Next we've got a disciple connects. That was that key word, but actually I told you wrong because there's actually one more part before I want to get to you. So I'll just say, hey, hey, Pastor Jane, now's the time, okay? (laughs) Can you believe I I wrote this and I still got it wrong telling you what? (laughs) Goodness gracious. A disciple connects. Jesus tells his disciples in John 15, 4, remain in me and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine. And you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. In other words, you can't just learn from me. You can't just mimic me. You must also be connected to me. And this harkens back to last week when we talked about worship being us connecting our heart to God. This is vital to being a disciple. We've got to abide like a branch abides connected to a tree. We must remain connected to Christ through the Holy Spirit so that we can be a disciple, so that we can bear fruit and we can do what He's designed us to do. And as disciples of Christ, yes, we're connected to Him, but we're also connected to each other. You know, that's why we have some of the groups that we have. You know, we have discipleship groups. We have some groups that are designed and deliberate. On Sunday mornings, we have some Sunday school classes. On Monday mornings, we have a women's Bible study. On Tuesday evenings, we have our our men of action. Uh, We have a young adult group that meets. We have a Shabbat group on Friday night. There are multiple designed and deliberate groups that lead to discipleship. But I think that we also have groups that be kind of, sometimes it's impromptu, it's often very informal, that that's still part of discipleship. I went went this past Monday to breakfast with some guys, and we sat around and we talked about life. We were connecting with each other as we talked about how God was working in our life. I went Friday with a group of guys up to see David Morris. And, you know, a car ride is a good opportunity to talk about what is God doing in my life. And there was worship music in the background. Listen, we didn't open the scripture and deliberately talk about specific passage, but we were still doing discipleship together because God was in charge of what we were doing and we were talking about what God was doing in our lives. You know, I don't think that, yes, there were definitely times where Jesus deliberately taught from the scriptures, but I don't think he pulled a scroll out every time he had something he wanted to talk about to his disciples. Sometimes it was just this Because he was connected here and he would talk here. We need this connection. I encourage you, be a part of a deliberate small group that's designed 
for discipleship, but also look for those opportunities where you can just connect with fellow Christ followers. All right. And it may not be deliberate, but you don't know what God's going to lead you into. And you can receive a big blessing just from those informal, impromptu discipleship groups. But the, the, the fourth thing I want to talk about uh, uh, being a disciple. A disciple reproduces and teaches. A disciple reproduces and teaches. In Matthew 28, 19 and 20, this is a very familiar passage, but this is the Great Commission. It's for his disciples. It's for us. There we read, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. The verbs go and make tell us to take action. All right, To not be satisfied just being a Christ follower, but instead to do what it takes to reproduce more Christ followers and more disciples. And in teaching them to obey, it's obvious that we're to take intentional action to instruct those disciples that have come about because we reproduced disciples. We must also teach them not only what to obey, not only how to obey, not even why, not just why to obey, but we also show them by time together how we obey. A proper disciple is always discipled by someone else while also discipling someone. Amen. A disciple is being discipled and discipling because a disciple reproduces and teaches. But I don't want to just stop at being Christ-like and I don't want to just stop at the, a formula for doing discipleship. No, the point is we want to do discipleship His way. We want to do discipleship His way. All right, And we have a ministry that we're restarting soon that can help you better understand how to do discipleship His way. And I can't think of a better way to learn how Jesus does discipleship than to actually be discipled by Jesus. I've asked our discipleship pastor, Pastor Jan, if she would come and talk for just a few minutes about this ministry restart that she's going to be leading, that she's going to be facilitating. Go ahead, Pastor Jan. What is Jesus calling you to? What does he want you to hear? What does he want you to see? What does he want to do in your life in order for you to give it away? The truth is, honestly, I don't know. But I do know this, that our God is calling each and every one of us to draw closer to him. Amen. To become better listeners. Yes. So that we can better know his voice. Amen. To be more attentive to what he's doing in our world. You see, God wants to stir us up. Mm -hmm. He wants to tear down the strongholds and any, any form of bondage that's holding on to us. He wants us to press into his heart. Right. He wants us to fall deeper in love with him than we've ever thought was possible. He wants to fill us with his Holy Spirit and cleanse us and empower us to face adversity. So starting on May the 2nd, it's a Thursday at 5 o'clock, we're going to meet right here and we are going to sit at his feet and we are going to listen to what Jesus has to say to us. We're going to practice living in his presence. Mm. You see, to be a disciple of Jesus, to make disciples, is not about whether or not we have time or whether or not we have skill. It's about values. Is what we value what Jesus values? Mm. He values those of us who will seek after him. Mm. So you're invited. Come on May the 2nd and for every Thursday throughout the summer, we will meet together 
and we will intentionally seek to be discipled by Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Jan. If you're wanting to be a part of this group or if you simply want more information about this discipleship opportunity, please reach out to Pastor Jane. I know she would love to talk more to you, more with you about this. I've heard so many testify about the Discipled by Jesus groups in the past and the impact that it's had on their life. So I'm excited to see what God is going to do through this discipleship ministry. I, I'm currently reading the book by Hal and Debbie Perkins, Discipled by Jesus. And, and one of the concepts that really jumped out to me as discipleship his way was the concept of vertizontal connection. Vertizontal connection. Yes, I know that that word sounds like it's a made up word, but I mean, aren't, aren't all words really made up? But this is, this is the perfect concept for doing discipleship. How Perkins describes it this way. He says, in public, Jesus lived vertizontally. He always lived by faith in his father, being as aware of his father's presence, vertical, as he was of the people and circumstances. In other words, Jesus was always not just aware, but connected to his Father vertically and to those around him horizontally. And while there are many examples that we could point to of Jesus living vertizontally, I believe one of them is found in John 14, verses 9 to 11. Here we read, Jesus said to him, Have I been with you for so long a time, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? The one who has seen me has seen the Father. And how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own. But the Father, as He remains in me, does His works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe because of the works themselves. In replying to a request from Philip to see the Father, Jesus says, I am in the Father in other words, even as I talk to you, I am connected to, I'm in communion with the Father. As we participate in Christ-like discipleship, we must do the same. We are always connected vertically through our faith in the Father as we participate horizontally with the people around us. As we disciple and are discipled, we don't just do it horizontally, talking about our experiences and our thoughts and our knowledge. No, we've got to draw vertically from the Father as we participate horizontally. So as we do discipleship His way, I want you to lean into the connection of the, that's a vertizontal connection. And as we lean into this vertizontal connection, we're able to do his disciple, or discipleship his way with patient action. That's the next one. Patient action. Jesus' patience with his discipleship is evident all throughout the Gospels. Look at Matthew chapter 20, starting in verse 20. Here we read, Then the mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus with her sons. She knelt respectfully to ask a favor. What is your request, he asked. She replied, In your kingdom, please let my two sons sit in places of honor next to you, one on your right and the other on your left. But Jesus answered by saying to them, You don't know what you are asking. Can you just picture this in your mind? Jesus has been teaching his followers about his upside down kingdom where, where servants, where leaders are servants and the, and the first are last and so on and so on. And what does James and John, what does their mom come and do? She asks for her sons to be able to sit in the places of honor. She wants her boys to have power and recognition and respect in Jesus' kingdom. And I can just see Jesus putting his, putting his head in his hands as he says to her, you don't know what you're asking. These people, they still don't get it. All this time spent with him and they're still thinking about power and glory and honor. You can just imagine him thinking, good grief, what is wrong with you? But he doesn't snap at them. 
He just patiently continues to disciple. And sometimes, I know especially for our folks that are working with the little ones, or the folks that are working with, with, with teens, or the folks that are working with new followers or new-ish followers. The little ones, they got so much energy and maybe they've had bad training at home or no training at all at home and they, you just want to pull your hair out sometimes. But let me say to you, take patient action as you disciple. For that newish Christ follower that thinks they've got it figured out, they know how to do this Jesus thing and you got it all wrong. Take patient action as you disciple them. If it feels like it's getting a little hard to be patient, think about how patient Jesus was with his disciples. Or better yet, think about how patient and full of grace God has been with you. And let that inspire you to take patient action. As we draw to a close today, there's a, there's a few possibilities for response. First, maybe you're here and you're not a disciple yet because, well, you're not even a Christ follower yet. Today can be the day that your life changes. Admit that you're a sinner. Believe that Christ died and rose again so that you could have not only forgiveness but new life in Him and confess Him as Savior and Lord and your life will become new. You shall be saved. You, you can then begin this discipleship journey that, that makes life so much better. Not just here, but in heaven. If that's you today, we're going to be singing in a few moments. And if you know that you need to come become a Christ follower, come, come talk with me. You can do it while we sing. You can do it after, after the service is over. It's the most important decision you make in life. So if that's you today, don't pass up an opportunity. For others that are already on this journey, as, as our worship team go ahead and uh, comes to, to lead us in a final song, I, I, let these words that we're going to be singing in a few minutes, let them be a commitment for you. All right? Mean what you say when you sing, I will build my life upon your love. It's a firm foundation. I will put my trust in you alone and I will not be shaken. Now that's a commitment to discipleship. A, de a declaration that says, I'm going to give up my own way. I'm going to take up my cross and I'm going to follow. Because this is what Christ-like discipleship is. And I think there's even one more possible action you could take as we worship in song in a few moments. Maybe you feel God urging you to go deeper with your Christ-like discipleship. Remember, dis Christ-like disciples, they're being discipled and discipling. Maybe God is impressed upon you that you need to lean into the being discipled part a little bit more. Maybe you need to find a small group. Or maybe you need to start a small group. All right? Pray and ask God where He wants you to find your place so that you can be discipled. Or if He's impressed upon you that you need to increase how much you are discipling. We are always looking for Christ-like disciplers. All right? We have opportunities with our teens. Paige is a wonderful youth leader, but I know she would love some additional disciplers to help her with those teens. And I know the same can be true for Pastor Sherry with the children. And the same can be true with Pastor Jan as she's our pastor, our discipleship pastor, and, and she's coordinating these adult groups. If God is drawing you to be a discipler, come pray and ask Him for guidance and direction and also strength and patience. And then come talk to one of us. If God is telling you, you need to step up your discipling. All right? You can come talk to me. You can come talk to Paige. You can talk to Pastor Jan. You can talk to Pastor Sherry after the service. Wherever God is urging you to carry out what He has for you as far as discipling goes, go do it. Take action. In whatever the way the Holy Spirit is leading you now, I encourage you, respond to this message of Christ-like discipleship. Seek 
His will and follow His leading. Let's respond as the worship team leads us in, in a song. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Do you please stand with us? Jesus, name above every other name. Jesus, the only one that will ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. church is authentic and genuine Christ-like discipleship. Now go, as you go, let me say to you what Peter wrote in 2 Peter 3.18, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory 
both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Go and be, go and make Christ-like disciples. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, it is time to do the chair shuffle. No? Soup. I don't have a mock. Oh, there we go. I don't know.